When war broke out, just 77 Tomcats were left, two had crashed. With crews and maintainers scattered and Tehran cut off from Grumman, Hughes and the US Air Force and Navy, most of the Iranian F-14s were inoperable. The Ayatollah's Air Force managed to assemble 60 loyal pilots and 24 backseat radar operators. By stripping parts from grounded Tomcats, technicians were able to get a dozen F-14s in fighting shape. The fighting escalated and drew the F-14s into battle. In eight years of combat, Iran's Tomcat crews claimed some 200 aerial victories against Iraqi planes, 64 of which the Iranian Air Force was able to confirm. One F-14 pilot named Jalil Zandi reportedly claimed a staggering 11 air-to-air -air victories, making him by far Iran's deadliest fighter pilot of the war. The Iraqi High Command had ordered all its pilots not to engage with F-14 and do not get close if an F-14 is known to be operating in the area, Nasser Khani wrote. Usually the presence of Tomcats was enough to scare the enemy and send the Iraqi fighters back. At first, the F-14s were armed only with their internal 20mm cannons and the long-range Phoenix missiles. American contractors had not had time to integrate medium-range Sparrow and short-range Sidewinder missiles. Normal tactics called for F-14 crews to fire Phoenixes at their targets from 100 miles away or farther, but with no alternative armament Iranian aviators relied on the heavy AIM-54s for close-in fighting, as well, once even hitting an Iraqi plane from just 12 miles away, according to Iranian reporter Babak Tagbi. Eight F-14s fell in combat during the war with Iraq one accidentally shot down by an Iranian F-4, three struck by Baghdad's Mirage F-1 fighters, one hit by an Iraqi MiG-21, and two falling victim to unknown attackers. The eighth Tomcat that Tehran lost during the Iran-Iraq war reportedly wound up in Iraq when its crew defected. Tagbi claimed that U.S. Special Operations Forces infiltrated deep inside Iraqi territory in order to destroy the abandoned F-14 and prevent it falling into Soviet hands. Iranian Tomcats intercepted Iraqi MiG-25s on several occasions. But only one Iranian flyer succeeded in downing any of the Mach 3 MiGs. In September 1982 and again in December, Sharm Rastani struck MiG-25s with Phoenix missiles. Combat ops were hard on Iran's F-14 force. A lack of spare parts compounded the maintenance woes. After the revolution, the United States had frozen Iranian assets, embargoed Iranian trade and imposed other economic sanctions. The United Nations and many U.S. allies followed suit, cutting off Tehran from global supply chains. In 1981 an Iranian trade agent wrote to the London office of F-14 builder Grumman asking to acquire parts for Iran's Tomcats. Citing the new sanctions, Washington declined to grant Grumman a license to sell the components. It is the present policy of the United States government not to permit Grumman or any other defense contractor to obtain a license to provide Iran with these materials, the Navy told the New York Times. By 1984, just 15 or so of the twin-engine fighters were flight-worthy, according to Nasser Khani. 
technicians kept the 15 jets in good repair, mainly by taking parts from the roughly 50 F-14s that couldn't fly. Starting in 1981, Iranian aircraft industries began performing overhauls and upgrades on the F-14s as part of the Tehran's effort to make the country militarily self-sufficient. The upgrades finally added Sparrow and Sidewinder missiles to the Tomcats. The self-sufficiency program had help from Iranian agents working abroad, and at great risk to themselves, to divert spare parts for the F-14s and other weapon systems. America begrudgingly helped too, albeit briefly. In negotiating to free American hostages that an Iran-backed militant group was holding in Lebanon, the administration of press. Ronald Reagan agreed to transfer to Tehran badly needed military equipment, reportedly including Phoenix missiles and bomb racks. Iranian engineers added the bomb racks to four of the F-14s as early as 1985, transforming the Tomcats into heavy ground attack planes. Years later, the U.S. Navy would modify its own F-14s in the same way. Rustani flew the Bombcats' first ground attack mission in 1985, targeting an Iraqi field headquarters, but missing. Frustrated technicians boosted the Bombcats' weapons loadout with a whopping, custom-made 7,000-pound bomb, one of the biggest freefall munitions ever. As Iranian Commander-in-Chief Gen. Abbas Babi observed from near the front line, an F-14 lobbed the massive bomb. The estimated time on target passed, but nothing happened. Babi was getting ready to return to his jeep when a powerful blast shook the ground. The bomb had missed, but its psychological effect on Iraqi troops was surely profound. In many sectors, the self-sufficiency initiative worked. Besides producing all its own oil, Iran has declared itself autonomous in agriculture, steel production, electricity generation and civil aviation. Well before the advent of abundant oil wealth, Iranians have tended to see their country as a unique nation amply endowed with natural resources that could take care of itself without outside assistance, said Rudy Mathi, a history professor at the University of Delaware. But Iranian companies struggled to produce all the specialized parts that the Tomcat requires. In the late 1990s, the Air Force considered simply buying new planes to replace the F-14s, but China was the only country that would sell fighters to Iran. In 1997 and 1998, Iranian pilots evaluated China's F-8 and rejected it. Even deprived of spares and mostly grounded, the F-14s were superior to the Chinese planes in the eyes of Iran's air force. Tehran turned to the black market, paying huge sums to shady middlemen to sneak F-14 parts into Iran. American authorities became aware of the illicit trade as early as 1998. 